Stephen Lamke is a talented songwriter, singer, musician, poet, and festival curator, currently based primarily in Toronto, Ontario. A member of Constantine's and the co-founder and main operator of the You've Changed Records label, which, by the way, is celebrating its 10-year anniversary in 2019, Lamke is also the creative director of Sackville, New Brunswick's annual arts gathering, Sappy Fest. He is also a wondrous artist in his own right, and You've Changed has just released Dark Blue, one of his most acclaimed and accomplished solo efforts yet. I visited Steve at the home he shares with visual artist Sherry Boyle, who is a past guest on, on this show. And Steve and I talked about concepts like renewal, cycles, repetition, time, and other motifs that spring up on Dark Blue. We talked about You've Changed and his collaborative and business partner Daniel Romano. We talked about his plans for new music by him, as himself, and also by his band Constantine's. We also got into how guest introductions on my show happen these days. And we discussed other things as well. With the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it, and make flexible monthly pledges at patreon.com slash creativecontrol, plus in-kind support from CFRU 93.3 FM, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, this is the 471st episode of Creative Control, featuring the brilliant Stephen Lamke, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Six white horses coming down. Six white horses coming down. Hey, Steve, how's it going? Good, how are you? <laughs> Good. Thanks for having me at your in your home again. Thank you for coming to my home. What? What? Aren't you going to do the intro thing? Or are you going to put that on after? That's after. I don't okay. do. It. You think I do the intros with the guests right in their face? You have before. I, back in the day, I used to do that, but I don't think I've, I've, I've not done that on this show with you, have I? I don't remember. No, I never. I thought, I thought so. <laughs> like a radio thing? Yeah. No, I don't do that anymore. Like the nice long intro that you do. The nice long, flattering intro that yeah. sets everyone at ease. Yeah, but probably also makes them think, "Oh my God, I'm not as good as this guy thinks I am." Maybe I don't know. No, I don't do <laughs> I don't do them in the interviews anymore. I do it in post. Okay, it's often. I don't know if you've ever you listen. Do I to still this. get to approve it? No. <laughs> Did has that ever happen? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you can tell me if it's inaccurate afterwards, and I'll fix it. Yeah, sure. I'll fix the file. Is this your space or Sherry's space? It's sort of a shared space right now, more actively mine space yeah in terms of the active parts of this space but there's a lot of storage in here as well as you can see yeah your partner sherry boyle has been on my show as well she has and how would you characterize her work she's a visual artist or i would say visual visual, visual artist, artist is, right. is most <laughs> most accurate but in she, the visual realm but she she does all sorts of things this uh this might sound stupid and i'm 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 a little stupid but she works in the realm of sculpture as well. Yeah, sculpture. Does that count as visual art? If you look at it, yeah, I think it counts. <laughs> think of visual art. You think of like you know painting or or illustration. I mean, she is downstairs. We <laughs> could ask her. <laughs> we'll need another mic though. She did she not craft the um, what's on the cover of your new album? Oh, that's okay. I see where. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a segue. I should have been more savvy to where this was going. Yeah. She she, uh, she made the sculpture that's on the the cover of the album. Yes. And so it's what is it? It's like a, a serpent. It's yeah. It's a ceramic sculpture of a of a snake of some kind. Okay. And um, with a head inside of it. A head inside of it. Inside of it. Yeah. That it's. Oh, okay. Presumably I consumed. Have you not seen it? I have seen. Oh, what? Do you have the original here? No. Oh, okay. Well, there's there's oh, a, yeah. oh. the proof. There's the print proof of it hanging on the wall here. Oh, I see. The way a, a boa constrictor would consume like a, a goat. You would see like yeah. the outline of a goat. Or like, yeah, the elephant or whatever. Like in the beginning of the little prince. Oh, right. Of course. So what is that? Which is? I really hesitate to use as a <laughs> reference as early in the show, as if I'm constantly thinking about the little prince, but I'm not one of those guys, actually. No. Well, I just, it's a its a striking sculpture. It is. Um, yes. Is there a reason you chose that as a, a visual motif for a record called Dark Blue? Anything that in particular? Was- you know, I think the decision to use it as a cover actually predates the decision to call the album Dark Blue. So I would say the connection to me is 
there's a lot of discussion of of circular existence in the album maybe circular existence um like ritual and recurrence and um renewal maybe there's a lot of waking up on the record Mm. i've noticed a lot of waking up and coffee being made and days being greeted people being greeted first time thing in the morning i I hear a lot of renewal and morning the morning kind of strikes me as something that comes up Mm -hmm. morning yeah i think it's been pointed out to me that morning as a word i I maybe use a little bit too often throughout your i fall back on that word in my songwriting well does it this is going to sound cutting right to the 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 points of yeah my my failings here (laughs) failings i don't view them as failings i feel like um there's something going on in this record and and we're gonna we're jumping right into it which i wasn't i thought we would warm up a little bit but um we did the warm up with the uh intro (laughs) the the dissection of how i make the show (laughs) that was our warm-up but um there does seem to be a uh something of uh, a reckoning with uh, consciousness in Canada in terms of uh, how this nation came to be a little bit. I feel like that's swimming around in your record Um, kind of, and I don't mean to make too fine a point about connecting the morning with an awakening, Mm, but that seems to be sort of there when I hear this, uh, forgive me. I don't have the song titles in front of me. Is the song called, I will not lie to you. Yeah. It's okay. You don't have to. Are you going to get me a guide? Well, you got a, a CD here? here? We got a oh, yeah, you got the book. No, there's no CDs. Okay. There are no CDs at all, are there? No. You didn't make CDs? No. Okay. Is that right? Did I get that title right? I Will Not Lie to You? Yeah. And is that, how would you characterize that song per se? Because I view it as, you say, oh, Canada in it. Yeah. A couple of times. And it made me think. Okay. Well, yeah. You see where I'm coming from? I see where you're coming from. And I, uh, like, I would say that it's a very different my response is very different and unconnected to the original question of about the sculpture and about okay um, repetition. So maybe I'll try to answer that one a little bit first. Sure, of course. I think for me, the the talking about morning or talking about um, days recurring or talking about cycles of seasons and stuff is both an acknowledgement of that's how we understand time passing in our own lives. Like we live our lives in a linear manner in terms of getting older and cause and effect and things happen and you reflect on them in your memory and you anticipate the future but the background to all of that is that days are happening in sort of this expected way seasons are happening in sort of the expected way but a lot of that stuff is breaking down now the definitely in terms of seasons or weather recurring weather patterns are, are changing and stuff so trying to deal or think about that stuff is sort of the time structure that's in the background of the of the album this is one of the things i wanted to ask that's fascinating by the way i didn't clue into that but i'll i find sometimes i have the luxury of talking to people about their stuff and then it makes me rethink maybe Mm -hmm. what i thought was going on on the record but um so in terms of the sculpture like there's you know there's in some ways there's death involved in the in the but there's also you know it's if you die becoming food for something you're also part of life you circle know. of life type circle stuff. of life yeah which is i know it's a cliche a right? bit of a cliche yeah. but yeah and then also there's a lot of again just to sort of add to talk a tiny bit more about the connection of the album cover too there is also a fair amount of masks discussed and sort of ideas of presentation being discussed in some of the lyrics so you could look at that and say it's a mask in some ways masks and uh, or is duality an aspect of masking it must be i I, there's i think of uh back to back and both of me there's that seems to be happening a little bit on the record too you're kind of reflecting on this sense of self that is outside of self or maybe this extension of yourself is someone else i don't know is that going on not consciously but both of me the sort of narrative like that song surprised me like I don't know where it came from it, it mm. and it wrote itself sort of very quickly so I it's hard to actually really talk about that because like in terms of conscious thought like I didn't not sit down at the desk intending to write like a song about watching myself do things or watching myself leave and whatever sort of happens in that song it kind of happened it's the just, song the song happened? just kind of happened yeah so this, this is one of my 
thoughts uh, when I approach this record because I can't remember if we've we probably we've talked so much that we may have covered this before. Are you someone, or is this rather, is this record a reflection of a batch of writing, um, with the intent of the, the these songs comprising a record? Does any of this stem from past work that didn't quite make it to another record? Do you do you recall if this is just a, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how else to explain it, but is this just like a, a, a batch, an utterance <laughs> that comes from the same time and place? Do you recall? Yeah, I mean, basically, like, I, there's nothing on this that was left over from previous projects or anything like that. And do you remember um, when you started? I mean, I would have started basically, like, I never really stopped writing, so the earliest stuff on this would have been written fairly quickly after the last record. Right. You're done the last one and you keep going. Yeah, just keep going. And, like... I don't know. I, I don't. I don't actually quite remember what the earliest written of these would be. I think actually, like kind of the verses of the song "Dark Blue" were written. That song came together over quite an extended period of time, where I wrote the three verses and then a long time later wrote the chorus. Okay, which was just instrumental when I sort of made up that part, and then at some point it got the lyric over it, and then there was a whole different bridge at one point, and then. Uh, it sounds like I'm describing a very complex song and it's actually quite a simple song, but it kind of cohered over a very long time. But the verses, I think, were written pretty soon after writing Days of Heaven. Right. OK. So one of the reasons I ask is if, you know, you're a little foggy on the when. Sure. Uh, it sounds like. I mean, you have a rough sense of it, but in that same vein, I suppose, do you have a sense of what your mindset, where your mind was at when you were kind of crafting these songs? Like, do you have a, is there a commonality between things that were going on in your life or the culture at large that, because I, f- I feel like you're an oblique writer, but I also, there's a lot of direct stuff going on, which leads me to try to interpret things. But do you remember, like, do you remember where you were coming from, so to speak? I can tell you that the sort of initial idea for the record was, to write about sort of foundational stories and creation myths. And in the grant applications that I wrote to make this record, (laughs) which were um, for the most part denied, the project was called Creation Myths. And I just, that came from reading like a lot of like early Greek stuff and looking at the Bible and sort of coming to some of that stuff through like other poetry or whatever, like contemporary sort of poets that were looking at that stuff oh i see you would um oh, i see i see so i started thinking about like oh like how are our cultures made from like this debris or tradition or however you want to look at it mythology mythologies and then also thinking about like we tell ourselves foundational stories about ourselves like whether that's how you met your partner or you know how you came to write a song or something like yeah. those in telling those stories become like fairly related to myths i would say <laughs> You like a self mythology? A self mythologizing. Okay. Were you feeling self conscious about that? No, not at all. Okay. Um, I think it's super interesting. But so then I started to think about like that in telling stories, like that's how we kind of create meaning and sense for ourselves. And the other way that I started to think that we create meaning and sense for ourselves is through um, ritual um, and yeah. sort of the repetition of things. And I think about that in terms of songwriting. Um, where you write something (laughs) Jerry in the background enjoying that last one (laughs) where uh, you write something and then you uh, perform it over and over again Um, and that that creates a certain type of meaning for it that's that's interesting you said that because I've been kicking around a podcast idea I shouldn't even talk about it right now because I don't know if it has legs but I I am I am also obsessed with repetition Mm -hmm. because I I mean I engage in it on on some level here it's always different because it's different people but I am obsessed with the notion of people having to do the same thing every day yeah but it's always different like they like a, a, a baker like someone making who every day has to make the same number of loaves of bread sure but and I just I, I often wonder about the psychology of that myself, the ritual of that. There's psychology, and then there's also I started to think about this when I took the Sappy Fest creative director job yeah. a few years ago, and I'm going into my third festival now in that particular role with that organization. And this year is our 14th year, so I took over 
that job at the twelfth year, which is mm-hmm. you know that's a f- there's a fair amount of history there, mm-hmm. and so like started thinking about like what does it even mean that we get together in this scenario every at the same weekend every year, and then thinking about like what needs to be different, what needs to be the same for it to be sappy fest. You don't want things to become totally stagnant, but you also want them to be recognizable as themselves. And then realizing like in that sheer fact of the repetition of it, it kind of creates its own meaning. Like part of what's meaningful about Sappy Fest is that we've done it at this point 13 times, you know, and a bunch of the same people come back every year or people don't necessarily come back every year, but they come every few years and they know that it's happening. And so it's like part of their consciousness in a reoccurring way. Mm -hmm. So just the idea of that as a ritual made me realize like rituals don't have any like objective meaning like they don't refer to anything outside of themselves for their meaning they don't need to I should say they sometimes do but they don't need to and for those of us that maybe like have um, abandoned some of the traditions that we were raised within or raised in families that had previously abandoned many traditions um, realizing like oh we can actually like by partaking of and celebrating ritualistic activity you are creating meaning like it's an act of like human creation to do that well there's a certain element of tradition and ritual that the, I think the underlying sort of virtue for some is the inherent perseverance like the notion of, of getting to, or getting together at the Sappy Fest mm-hmm. or getting together every year to celebrate whatever pagan or Christian holidays we have there's a kind of it almost feels like a you're battling against time a little bit oh yeah time like you're gonna change everything exactly we're gonna keep doing the same thing in the face of whatever you're given us yeah so I wonder if that's part of what you're getting at yeah like that sort of aggressive tone that you're you're talking about um is i guess part of it but also like there is something like hopeful of like oh like by doing the same thing we're also looking forward to the next time we will do it and we're marking like the time that's passed since the last time so it is like a way that the human mind i think makes sense of things and creates like sort of meaning for itself but it seems to have informed your storytelling on this record uh, as well, like I mentioned earlier, that there's a lot of waking up, uh, there's a lot of coffee brewing, or mm-hmm. not a lot, but a fair amount, uh, and the, the, some of the pictures you paint of. We talked about this song the last time you were on the show, which wasn't that long ago, actually, when you were on with um, Construction and Destruction and Adam from Whoopso. Uh, we talked about this song about Daniel Romano, or rather inspired by a visit yeah. you had at Dan's house. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, the song at the start of the song yeah. you're referring to, um, that would have been the other really probably earliest one of this group of songs, yeah. um, which is also sort of as an aside, how it came to be part of that project with construction and destruction. Yeah. yeah right. But it was written at Dan's house at the end of a tour right after my last album days of heaven had come out. So that's, that, places that one in time yeah and and what i was trying to clumsily get at there is i feel like a lot of the imagery is um relatable like uh, when you talk about the coffee brewing and the and the looking out a window or whatever it is you're you're talking about or the books piled like i I think of the books piled by the bed sure uh, (laughs) as one of the things that struck me it's like oh i'm there i can actually relate to this i I read books. I have a bed, <laughs> and uh, I've stayed at someone's house and and uh, stayed in one of their guest rooms and seen that and wondered what that tells me about them. Mm-hmm, sure. What what books do they have? Yeah. Uh, it's it's sort of a weird thing we maybe don't even think of as a demonstrative act, having a library present or whatever. But but all I'm saying is like there there is a, like I'm trying to figure out if these are narratives that you view as external to you or are they very personal on some level because they're very relatable. Um, but I hear a lot of you and I are around the same age. And so I'm by, I have a prejudice. I know where you came from. I know where you are. Uh, I know we're both kind of middle-aged sure. and probably, and, and we're kind of straddling a, a line there. 
of our our families are getting our parents are getting older and in my case like my kids are getting up getting older too so i'm i'm seeing kind of when you talk about that circle of life or cycles of life i'm i feel like i'm in i'm on it i'm i'm in yeah. i'm in it in the middle of it somehow and it's going on all around me do you feel that a little bit do you feel like you're somewhere in the middle of in the middle of something so to speak yeah sure i mean like if you're asking that in the context of like do these songs am I trying to tell some narrative of my own life then not exactly like there's not the intent of that um but it's made it's all made from like the stuff of my life you know and so some of the perspectives are of I mean all the perspectives are of a whatever 40 year old guy <laughs> <laughs> well when you start when you hear a 40 year old guy start singing a song uh maybe adopting another person's voice about whether or not there should be uh, cut flowers at their grave. Sure. Uh, which is a striking song. I've seen you play this song a few times now, um, and it kind of quiets the room. I, I think mm-hmm. it's just a, it's a very stark and striking song um, because you don't often hear people making requests about such things. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? And I think it, it gets to well, people. Well, Richard Laviolette has directed us all how to you know approach his funeral as well if so. i die don't send no preacher yeah that's yeah. true it's true i mean uh, of course uh, sunset boulevard uh, <laughs> when you think of that film uh in the perspective it it's from the perspective of a someone who's crossed over so to speak anyway no i don't mean to make too fine a point of it but i i relate to the record on that level of just sort of thinking about where i've been where i'm going what the future holds for me and for the world without me Sure. And so I wonder if that's maybe swimming around. I mean, in terms of some of the stuff like you were asking and referencing, I will say like at some point it became conscious, but I definitely was writing in a visual space a lot more on this record than I have in the definitely the last record. A visual space? Yeah. Like, so there's a lot of words that refer to things that you see or actions that are happening rather than internal states. Like the books on the nightstand exactly like you- that would be a perfect example so i think like a lot of the lyrics are take place in the visual realm even though they're words and so they're in their song or spoken or whatever is that a striking distinction for you as a writer like i mean i i know you're writing but it's very different than the last album where all that stuff was cut out the last album I w- days of heaven was a like a very it ended up being a very internal inward looking or sort of outward looking into the cosmos kind of album not not it looking around the room or looking like out the window or looking like at the street or looking at the trees or whatever well we are in a certainly since days of heaven came out it feels like a particularly self-involved time um maybe a navel gazy time maybe it's always been this way but i can't tell or do you feel like you chose to tell stories from a less let's say introspective perspective because you were trying to get at that, like trying to get away from talking about yourself, so to speak, and trying to tell stories that might relate. Not to... so much. It's just like you're writing and some things like work for a while and then they kind of stop working either because you're done or they just stop and you have to sort of try and find what's going to work next or um, which probably has some kind of connection to your interest and what you want to have happen. But it's not necessarily a super conscious connection you keep using the word consciousness and unconscious you mentioned a song that just sort of occurred and you didn't intend to write Mm -hmm. both of me it just sort of happened is that new is that new for you to kind of i well yeah lose yourself to the process yeah i would say so definitely and especially like again in like very heightened contrast to the days of heaven album which was very like tightly edited down um some of those songs would have started as more um wordy more image filled more um but what was working for me then was that paring down to like fairly essential things and that was a fairly torturous way to make make songs at like even at the time but it was what felt right like it felt like what needed to happen for me were you self-editing or did you oh yeah yes okay yeah completely self-editing so i think at one point this time I did decide I got to loosen this up. Like I'm like, I'm driving myself crazy. It's also not that fun. It's not even necessarily coming across the way I intend or whatever. So that 
ended up being just like a process of learning to trust myself and like okay this thing can be kind of looser and it can be kind of ambiguous and it can like I mean I still edited stuff got cut because I like it didn't make sense or you know but like I trusted myself on some stuff in here that I like would actually have trouble sort of explaining but Mm. I trust that it has its own internal sense like my I feel like my instincts of having having written a bunch of songs in my life like my instincts are developed of maybe what's working and what's not so when you the record is sort of just out uh, but you've lived with it longer than the world has yeah. like do you have I've asked a little bit about its sort of um, origin story I guess and mm-hmm. maybe your mindset but when you kind of step back and look at these songs do you notice sort of discernible themes patterns of like we we talked about a few of them but is there something about it that a through line that you're like oh huh yeah not like not in a super coherent way like there is a bit of like like the the point we started on like the background of of sort of circular yeah yeah uh time like that's fairly consistent and then there is like moments including like the very end of the record kind of breaks from that and there's a moment of like sort of transcendence of that so there's some stuff but it's not like some like it's it's intended to sort of be filled with all the stuff of life you know not just have like one point to make but i mean within the kind of for you anyway radical some in some cases there's some radical departures in your process here yeah, are there things sure. about that that you feel worked better than others or the thing is this is this a new approach is this going to inform your next work yeah it might but well I, there's actually like a whole other record that's done um a sort of weirder smaller project record I made on a residency in the fall um, while this record was sitting waiting to come out oh wow okay so in some ways like I actually do know exactly what the next thing is going to be like because it already exists it's done Um, it's done yeah but I I don't know it might just live on my computer or it might like it might not be like the official official sure kind of follow-up not that I'm involved professionally with any officials but well I mean um we can talk about that too. And, and by the way, I didn't say this yet because we haven't got to it, but congratulations on 10 years of running You've Changed Records. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, that's official. That's real. That's a, Yeah, it's official, <laughs> but it's also just me, so <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Um, <laughs> so you, you have a record that's done and it's it doesn't necessarily follow any of the patterns or lyrical themes as... Yeah, I don't, like, I don't think clue. there's going to be any accuracy in me guessing what is going to like work next for like continuing to write songs well i just wondered i think that yeah no no i i i I, every time i think i've got like a process figured out it's surefire that's not going to work the next time i try to do that you know i'm going to have to figure out something different but that's the interesting thing about traditions and rituals is that (laughs) they refine themselves or or you refine them that's the that's what i find yeah you're also kind of recreating them every time too it's a it's a strange but but then you're yeah. like ah, mm-hmm. eventually something drops out from that recreation. You're like mm-hmm. ah, that I don't want to do this at in that by this in this room. Yeah, I'm gonna go do this at the coffee shop, or I'm gonna go do this in the, whatever. It's just like you you fall into your pattern, but something shifts within you, or you're not happy with mm-hmm. it, and um, that that's a fascinating part of yeah, definitely creative work as well. So I think like all the mornings on this on the record are more like better understood as being like a a way to recall that like oh yeah this is a morning and like tomorrow there'll be another morning and and rather than like some sort of metaphor of like the new dawn or the new day of like a break no i i gather that i gather that i think that's what people say when they've had a rough day well tomorrow's another day sure (laughs) you know and that's that's true and tomorrow's another day if you had a great day too exactly no it's it's, 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 it's there's no way to uh yeah Every high and low is weirdly recreated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the more you just keep doing them, uh, that's true. Uh, we haven't talked yet about your. Um, we, I mentioned you've changed. Uh, we haven't talked about some of your collaborators on this album, mm-hmm. including Daniel Romano, yeah. whom you started. You've changed with, and um, because I think there's been a. I always think of you as a very. Um, I've always thought of you as a very sophisticated uh, musician, uh, but certainly 
Days of Heaven was a I thought just a remarkably beautiful and sophisticated musical achievement and then this record has that too it has it's mm. a different it seems like a different sound uh, it's obviously different people um and you've had there's all sorts of uh there's multitudes of sounds within you I know uh from your time as as Baby Eagle and the Constantines and and now as yourself but this collaboration and this group created something pretty unique for you can you talk about who's on the record and maybe how the music and the, that collaboration worked yeah definitely well the the core is um daniel romano playing drums and me playing guitar and our friend dave nardi playing bass and the, we're the ones sort of playing all the tracks on all the songs i mean and then ian romano played a little bit of extra drums on two tracks sorry who's the primary drummer dan Oh, Dan played the... Oh, okay. I'm yeah, sorry. Dan, yeah, yeah, Dan played all the drums. Okay. I just assumed Ian played all the drums. No, no. Ian's <laughs> on two songs. He's on... Uh, at the start of the song, both he and Dan were playing a single drum kit. Um, like, at the same time. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> it was cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then on the, the song White Horses, Ian plays the drums. That's a remarkable song, by the way. I think arrangement-wise, that's a really cool song. Cool. Even the background... Vo- like, there's a background vocal allusion to something i think is it who's doing the backups is it just dan it's down yeah Yeah, double tracked or something yeah so he does an allusion to something you say later that i found really (laughs) fascinating uh and i'm blanking on what what's the what do you remember and the light shines and the light shines through and yeah it's great i loved everything about that it's it's a cool there's a cool little flourishes there and he does really nice uh I guess background vocals or he does like a he comes in every once in a while mm, with the chorus yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, that's all cool, but I was actually gonna ask about the drums. Yeah. Because I, I I love the drumming on the record and it occurred to me that many songs seem to start with drums. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if that's just because of who was drumming and, and whatnot, but uh That's probably fair to say that that's because <laughs> of who was drumming. So what was the musical collaboration? Uh I've I've already uh, praised you for your musical sophistication, but I do hear Dan. Mm-hmm. I hear yeah, his, Dan's great. I hear Dan's sort of touches here and there. Yeah, and the drumming and the rhythms are really cool. They are very cool. So, what's going on with you and the drums? With me and the drums? Well, like you, like, like yeah. Let's start these songs with the drums. They're cool. It's a, these are cool beats. No, nah, it's kind of it's more <laughs> just like what happens, and like as like a guy that writes songs over like guitars like I will admit like I will say one of my weaknesses as a songwriter is like I don't th- sometimes think about like the intro oh, you know what I mean yeah. I'll just like I talked about this with Shock and Jimmy actually not that long ago it's like we both kind of just like we'll just start you know like yeah, yeah. we'll strum like the first chord for like sure. a bar and then we'll start singing or whatever yeah. and I want to get away from that because I think there's more to do but so I mean in a really banal silly way like it's a way to have an intro you know have the drummer do something it's unusual for you I, I guess you're just alluding to that like yeah you know. sure I think like the thing with Dan is I also went into the the session with like I don't know if this will be the record like but we'll see what happens kind of like was this, this could this studi- could be a start this is was at his studio at his studio okay and I had not recorded with Danny in a long time I think the baby eagle dog weather record was the last time we recorded together which is 2011 or something yeah. maybe it came out yeah so quite a long time ago and i just kind of went in with complete trust and i think he went in with complete trust in me and we had toured before recording i opened a tour uh in europe for him for like 25 shows or something it's pretty long um, he was out even longer but the part i was on was fairly long so we had been playing a bit kind of just a couple months before making this record so we didn't talk about that stuff too too much and I, yeah i don't remember if, like too much like reining in or too much directing him like well beyond the drums though like did he have a how much of a uh like did you come in with all the kind of guitar parts and arrangements figured yeah, out or? i would say so yeah. okay okay yeah. so he wasn't rearranging things no this no no okay no I mean, he engineered it, so he was the one sort of setting up the mics and the one also with the headphones on a lot of the times, mm-hmm. um, as well as playing the drums. And I should also say, like, he played guitar, sort of an overdub guitar on, I don't know, maybe half the record or something. Yeah. Like, a fair amount um, and some really sweet parts. And 
And then the other musician who we didn't mention that is involved, uh, Mark LaLama, plays a few amazing piano parts and accordion? Uh, the accordion on the one, too. Yeah, that's great. He's a fantastic musician, yeah. amazing musician. And he's played with Dan a bunch. He is He lives like 10 minutes from Dan's house, and he has an amazing studio. And in terms of... Um, that sort of rearrangement or production role, I would say that song, uh, My Love is Impure But Enduring, which is the one featuring the accordion, was the one that like wasn't working. And it was an important song to me. I thought like I think the song is really well written and I like it, but it was just like this I was I there was a moment of worry that it was not going to make the cut until we figured out like the accordion might be the answer to all of our all of our problems yeah, with it. sounds amazing, um, yeah. And Mark's fantastic, and he did sort of one pass at all those tunes, and and he played some of the coolest stuff ever on like the <laughs> piano and some of those tunes and the accordion. It just, it gave, the accordion is like such a sort of symphonic instrument in terms of the... It's big, com- you can't ignore it. It's big, and the complexity yeah. of like the sound and the, the number of notes you can play at the same time and stuff, all that stuff was like, it's, it can be an orchestra for you know for a guy like me that doesn't have an orchestra or Mm. for like you know people in a small peasant town (laughs) or whatever you know (laughs) that's why it's in so much so many folk musics you know yeah it's it's portable and big it's portable and a big sound and it's also pretty rhythmic if you play it in a certain way so i don't know i love accordion i've always wanted to have one on uh, in my music so that was really cool this feels like you accomplished a lot with this particular record, like in terms of your own practice and things you've wanted to do and attempt? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I wasn't thinking about that, I guess, but sure. Well, I, don't I mean, when, when we recorded, I went, I re-recorded the vocals on that. We'd already done the vocal on that tune, but I was like, I want to sing over the accordion. <laughs> oh, with it in, your, in yeah. your headphones? Yeah. So I was like, I don't know if it's any better than the take I had, but, you know, I definitely wanted that experience of having the accordion in in my band for you know you're not gonna have once. that live i assume no i don't think so unless the so. stars align maybe yeah exactly you're, you're or if there's any young accordion <laughs> players out there that <laughs> want to jump in next why do we have to be young well because older you, people you need an inexperienced accordion player no i mean experience <laughs> is great experience is great <laughs> you should get the, the younger maybe more often uh willing or able to jump into a crazy situation yeah, the, because they don't have other plans yeah, already the time on their hands maybe. yeah time or the willingness to be reckless yeah your singing here is also uh striking to me uh, you seem to have um come into a, a kind of approach to singing that is interesting some of it's sort of whispered singing i find mm-hmm. uh, i've noticed that a lot more like softer singing um and every once in a while you kind of raise your voice a little bit but it's it it, it sets a real tone um is that new is that something you've been trying to figure out or yeah i mean i have a weird voice that i'm always trying to figure out and it changes i feel like it's already sort of i'm using it different now than i did a year ago when we recorded this so it's oh, is like, that right? i don't know if it's like an ongoing active thing you know hmm. same with everything like you're trying to get better all the time or develop new things or yeah yeah yeah. and whatever. trying new things with what you have trying new things with what you have yeah, yeah okay i just wondered if if you felt like it um contributes to obviously it contributes to a certain mood and tone or, or i just wonder if again I, I don't mean to keep going back to this or i, I went to it early uh, this song i will not lie to you and there's a real dynamic aspect to your attack on that as a singer um it's kind of an angry song What's well, it's it ab- an entirely angry song. What is it about, would you say? What, what were you trying to go for there? I mean, it was, it's, I don't know if it's accurate to say this is what I'm trying to say in the song, but the song is definitely, like, in my life, like, it's a response to learning about, like, the history of this country and broken treaties and, and like, the ongoing sort of exploitation and, and, and lies that are being told about that, you know, for sure, like, directly. So that song was written with, like, definite intent like as opposed to like i would say most of the other songs on this record um it was a song like i was i sat down was like i want to write like something dealing with like these feelings that of anger that i'm having yeah um that being said like in terms if i if i were to step back and sort of objectively evaluate all these songs i would actually say like i don't know if that's that good a song 
You know what I mean? But it maybe does what I needed it to do at that time. Huh. It's not that good. I I brought it up twice at least. (laughs) So it's obviously spoken to me. I don't know. You can't be objective about whether or not it's that great a song maybe, but I... It stuck out to me. I didn't mean that to like, oh, we shouldn't talk about it. Like, no, no, no. Whatever. But I, I, I find it striking to me that the song that had the most intention that mm-hmm. maybe follows your previous creative patterns of being diligent about what you're doing and and, and maybe uh, probably in this case, I imagine because you were really trying to focus on what you wanted to say, you were probably more hands on with that song on some level than the ones that you said the other ones you say kind of float out of you a little and you let it go a little bit. This one was one you hung on to. And I, I find that striking that that's the one you're like, I had an idea. I wanted to express it. I did, but it has a clear intention as opposed to the other ones, which are more nebulous in their own way. They're scene setting. They're maybe a bit more universal. They don't come from me in a way, the way mm-hmm. this one. Anyway, I'm not this not to armchair psycho- psych- psychologically profile you, but I do think that's striking. I will tell you that it was <laughs> it was it's part of a fairly unique experience in my life. And that is the unique experience of like of high productivity. <laughs> and oh, it was a batch of there was a batch of three songs that I wrote in the course of a week which for me is an incredible amount of output I do not write that fast even songs that I write fast like I'll write a song fast sometimes but then like I won't write for a long time right. or whatever or I, I haven't written for a long time so these were the last three songs written for this record and the first one of the batch was Major Rager mm-hmm. and that song was written basically from collaging together stuff that I'd written like in like sort of my free writing kind of practice okay and and like mostly stuff from the tour i did with dan just sort of before making this record so it's just sort of like i don't know i felt the itch to make something that day and i'm like okay like i'm gonna oh there's something you know and then okay there's something else there's something else and kind of just put it together and sort of followed and played i played with rhyme a lot more on this record than i ever Mm -hmm. have before and Mm -hmm. that um, can kind of lead you on a path sometimes so it can be like a generative thing to to use rhyme sometimes yeah I, I tend to freestyle rap with my son all the time so that and that takes you down weird paths because yeah. you're just rhyming so the that's rhyme, that yeah. song was written kind of in that mode and then basically immediately finishing that and that song I think sort of hints at like what I see as like the defining characteristic of these years which is anger Mm -hmm. and so then the next song was i will not lie to you which was maybe dealing with my own anger and the sort of justifications for that anger right and just trying to say something so it it was written with a more of a conscious intent and then the song both of me which we just discussed earlier like i I did not know there was another song coming like it was just kind of like whoa there it is like i think i literally finished writing I will not lie to you and then went for a jog and both of me kind of happened in my head on that jog so maybe I've tried to I've drawn too fine a point on some sort of conclusive aspect of of I will not lie to you but I uh, about why you might be somewhat less satisfied with it as a song and I mean I shouldn't have said that I think you're right in picking it out as like oh this one's different like for sure yeah well and I also know that the stuff you're dis- discussing, the anger you're discussing, it's anger I've had. I know it's anger you've had. I know in your in your practice, even at, as the Sappy Fest creative director and other conversations we've had. I mean, these are issues you're you're hoping you can. I don't want to, uh, yeah, address and and also um, I don't know, try to speak to mm-hmm. on some level with with your work and. So uh, I knew it. I knew it when it, I heard it. I'm like, oh, okay. I this this sounds like conversations we've had, or this yeah. sounds like acts you've like things you've done to, you know, it, to further this the cause in a positive way. Um, I don't know. I just heard all that. That's all. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I shouldn't have said the thing about not thinking it's that great a song, and I don't know why I brought it up, but I I have had that thought. I was like, I don't even know if this is any, like, but there's like that doesn't mean there's not a use for it. No, I think it's uh, you know, or that I regret doing it. Like it's on it's on the first side of the record. Like it's not buried anyway. It's like there it is. Like you don't have to defend yourself against the thing you said. I yeah. think it's a great song, and uh, it stuck out to me. I brought it up 
three or four times now. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I don't, I don't think uh, it should diminish the song, uh, anything you've said here. I think uh, I can see where you, I think, I also think that sometimes uh, when you, when we emote and uh, in your case or my case, maybe you make something that freezes that emotion. Uh, yeah, you can have a complicated relationship with that. That it, that the thing you expressed, whether it's a sadness, a happiness, uh, an anger, you might be a little like, "Wow, I really said how I was really feeling," and that's raw to me still. Yeah, and I think like in particular, anger. If we're thinking about like in reference to what I was sort of trying to get at earlier, but like songs as being like a ritualistic act and like a point of where you return to. Like, I don't know if that anger is one that like. I want to return to with the same frequency that I might want to sure. return to something else. Yeah. No, that's in terms of actually like experiencing it or engaging with it. But I, th- so I think that anger is still totally valid. And I think, you know, the things we've been told about this country are, you know, worth being angry about. Well, and I think you have a practice where you can express anger in a constructive way mm-hmm. for yourself or for, per, per, it's got me thinking about things. So it's, it's done something it's done. It's it's done its job. If it had a job, I think it's done it. Is is my point? Um, I did say I did mention that it's ten years of of you've changed, which is a label you started with Dan Romano. I don't really want to get into too many big picture music industry things with you about it, but because there's lots to say about how things probably are better than they ever were and worse than they ever were in terms of being in in your realm as both a musician and running a label. But ten years, I mean, that's a milestone. Can you encapsulate a feeling you have about this, this milestone? <laughs> like, what are you feeling about this? Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I, 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 I understand the question. I want to be yeah. careful about uh, getting too far down a rabbit hole in terms of the infrastructure of this sort of thing. But I'm just curious. I think it's really cool that we are all active in making new stuff. And I think, you know, Dan is an inspiring artist for his continual evolution um so to think back over 10 years like it's cool to see what dan's done i think it's cool to see what ian kehoe has done over 10 years who was also involved at the very beginning uh and hopefully cool to think about what i've done over 10 years or shuck and jimmy you know and like all the other people we've worked with like it's i don't know it's cool yeah it's cool I th- but i think like the fact that we're it's still an ongoing thing is maybe the success of yeah. it, you know? Like the fact that we're still practicing artists and no one's really like dropped out or moved on to like something else entirely, which is interesting. Yeah. I don't know. It speaks to that perseverance against time thing that I was maybe saying earlier. Yeah. I don't know. It's like, it's it's always been a process of trying to figure it out. Like every, like whatever six months from now like the whole context of how people are going to put out a record is different as they were different six months ago and like it's different for every project too like the way this spring we put out an ian kehoe record my record and a partner 45 and like the way a partner record comes out is very very different than the way like my record comes out in terms of like what we do and like who pays attention and who doesn't Mm -hmm. and like all that stuff or what the expectations are and like so it's like trying to it's just always about trying to find the right thing for the right project and try to find the right home for it and in like whatever consciousness out there there might be do you have a a sense of what drives that six month change that you're talking about is it the technology is it the industry is it the audience i can't tell anymore i think a lot of it's technology for sure yeah for sure definitely i mean 10 years ago i don't think there was any streaming yet was there uh 10 years ago 2009 well i mean i used to work at a place at cbc that streamed music all the time it wasn't like but in terms of that like on demand yeah well no you could that that was the interesting thing about that experience i had at cbc radio 3 was that for better or for worse whether you liked the the music and or, or not but it was this hub for canadian music uh mostly independent music and one of the things that was revolutionary about it at the time was this thing where people could make their own playlists, like w- mm-hmm. whatever the artist put up, you could add it to your own thing and create your own. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, true, yeah, yeah. a lot of people were kind of doing, well, not a lot of people, I think it was seen as like, what is this? Like, who does this? How does mm-hmm. this work? So on that level, um, that was going on, but not, it was that 
whole model was kind of supplanted by the big boys yeah. getting into it and saying, yeah. here's a whole, here's every Ray Charles record. <laughs> you can yeah, just yeah, yeah. stream them all if you Forever, want to. Forever, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think 10 years ago was kind of like the beginning of what came to be recognized as like the vinyl boom, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. maybe. And then, so like that's come and gone or come and stayed. <laughs> I don't know. And like CDs are still kind of around. And like there was a while, there was definitely a few years where like the missing piece of the puzzle seemed to be trying to get like enough iTunes downloads or whatever. And like that doesn't exist. I don't think right. really anymore. Right. Like we're on such a small level. So it's like, I don't know. We are an artist run label. So the focus is always just on like making the next piece of art. And then the rest of it's just trying to make the best of what we can do with it. You know? Yeah. Well, I, I, like I say, I, I'm, as you know, I'm a supporter of the label and of you and I, I appreciate that you're both doing things. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's been cool to be involved with projects. Like it's been cool to be in the studio with partner. It's cool Mm -hmm. to like see Napa's records come out into the world. Like that stuff's rad. It's it's like exciting. And you know, I learn about stuff. Didn't know what some 41 sounded like before I went in the studio with partner. (laughs) Are they big fans? (laughs) Yeah, maybe. (laughs) Yeah. I had a conversation with everyone brings up either some 41 or blink 182, some band with a number that I never listened to. I could have them totally mixed up too. Yeah. I think it might be blink 182. Cause they talked about that on my show. Really blink 182. I questioned them. I'm like, come on. Really? I thought that was kind of a joke band, but it happens with all young bands. They yeah. always bring up Blink-182. Okay, well, they, anyway, they might be both. <laughs> they I might don't be know. Both. It probably is both. <laughs> anyway, um, do you have anything uh, in terms of news you want to share? Is there any, uh, you've changed stuff that you can divulge at this point beyond what you've just described? Um, the partner thing, Ian's got a record, Ian Keo's got a record out, you've got a record yep. out. Uh, they, Those are uh, all out now, yeah. More plans, more releases for this year, or? Yeah, there's one other thing locked down for the summer. Okay. And then I don't know if there'll be anything else. Okay. We'll see. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, you don't have to develop. But so, yeah, there's there's stuff in the works and I don't know. And you've got a record you're sitting on that may or may not come out. May or may. Yeah, I don't know. It'll come out in some capacity, but it might come out like on Bandcamp or something. Okay. Or it might come out like, I don't know. I might make a, another chat book or something with it, okay. the lyrics. And I don't know. It'll it'll be treated differently than than this because it is a different thing like it's completely self-recorded self-played kind of written like in a very constricted environment and constricted period of time where was the residency in bc oh okay. swantula bc so off the north end of vancouver island oh okay malcolm island okay yeah it was awesome and i've kind of had never done that before like i never just sat in a room like above a barn and made a record completely by myself what what distinguishes it from a uh uh, demos or a record i mean why do you think yeah i mean it could it it, you could listen to that and say like these are demos for another record and maybe they will be i don't know Okay, okay but i put it together in a way that kind of to me is satisfying as like a weird little project okay and I don't, yeah, I shouldn't even say weird little pro- as a little project. You know, I shouldn't say it's weird. I don't want to qualify it. Like, it's just like, it's a different thing. Weird for you, not, not necessarily for us. Sure. Receiving it's it. lo-fi. Like, it's lo-fi compared to, like, what yeah. would be considered the standards of, <laughs> of audio. <laughs> okay. Right. I'm not going to win the Best Audio Engineer Juno Award. Well, I mean. For it. Not yet. Maybe not yet. someday. Maybe someday. Yeah. Lifetime achievement. Um, there's another collaboration with Construction and Destruction that's done. Oh, okay. Which that might be the next thing that kind of comes out, from but we haven't really talked about. Not from that same session. No, different. When we did the tour, De- which you interviewed us, yeah, yeah, uh, right. yeah, on, which was in December, we did a session at Adam's house. Adam oh, from okay. Whoopsu. Cool. So there's another batch of three songs which we did, which is really cool, and the recording's awesome. So that'll come at some point, I think. I'm pretty sure Construction and Destruction is also finishing up a record, so that's kind of where their priorities oh, okay. are right now. Okay. So we'll probably do it next time we have opportunity to like do a few things together or something. Okay. Because so that was a very fun like project, and it's I, like I've that band and those people have been part of my life for like a long time now. So it's sort of nice to think of that as like an ongoing kind of when we're together, like we could do another sort of iteration of that yeah it was great to see you guys on uh, I got to see one of the shows and 
you, you were part of construction and destruction for a bit and they were yeah part of your thing for a bit and yeah we've toured together so much and like I've been at their house like a million times and we've made records together and we've done that project together and so yeah it's cool um and so with three songwriters the three songwriters is a neat like it creates its own unique kind of form like wow we could each just write one song and the sort of triangulation of those things creates a new uh yeah portal into outer space <laughs> <laughs> or something okay yeah that definitely <laughs> seems like outer space where uh, if you were just to try and write three songs on your own like it'd be like hard to sort of conceptualize it maybe right yeah no I, I or something like right. there's just something cool that it's both sessions that we've done like it's like oh there's something kind of neat happening in this yeah i like the first one because yeah. it was three individual or three individual songwriters but but everyone collaborated yeah I so this is the exact same format but that's cool yeah, yeah. just done a whatever a year later and in a different place and yeah. yeah there was um talk of uh or rather for anyone who's seen the constantines in the last little bit there were they would have noticed uh what four or five I want to say four or five new songs, maybe something like that. So a few, few like new songs. Yeah. Is there, <laughs> and I'd heard there was talk of demos and, and whatnot. Is there any activity on that front? Cause you guys no. played shows in December, right? Yeah. Right now. No, it's just, again, like getting everybody in the same place at the same time. Okay. Kind of obstacle. There's a bunch of songs. There's yeah five or six songs. We did demo them a shockingly long time ago now. Really? like a year ago oh um but yeah i don't know it'll be cool if, <laughs> if, when it ever happens you know i don't sure. know i don't mean to be nosy i just people listening might be interested yeah there's news and there's no news like the shows were good the shows, shows were great yeah, yeah. Good. it's fun to do i want to i do want to sort of make sure it's like an ongoing creative thing as well as a yeah like whatever every year Christmas we would do a show like I don't have that much interest in that you want it to be active I want it to be kind of active on on that other level as well right right okay fair enough and um, I think it will like it is in the the most abstract sense of well everyone's of doing being. their own thing right and everyone's doing their own thing and yeah schedules are tough you know well it's nice to know that you're keeping so busy with yeah. it doesn't sound like you have a choice you got a lot to keep up with a lot of stuff <laughs> So where can people stuff? <laughs> where can people go to learn more about uh, you've changed records? Yeah, you've changed records dot com, mm-hmm. um, and like you know, pretty easily findable on all the social media stuff. Yeah. I think. Yeah, you're on a bunch of stuff. I think it's whatever at you've changed records at all of them. Maybe so, Twitter's at you've changed Rex or something. I can't remember. You'll find us. It's pretty amazing le- lately how many instances or iterations of you've changed i keep coming across oh yeah like just the phrase i is it kehoe that sort of coined it for the label yeah uh, it's a welland expression it's, yeah like something you've the, changed it was like a diss yeah because nick ferrio has a song called you've changed on his new album oh yeah i don't know if you've heard it but he's got like a, it's about his uh, lady friend having a baby uh-huh. so it's called you've changed and i'm kind of the same but we're different uh, at the same time. And then uh, Al Tuck says, you've changed on an old song of his hmm. called Not A Lot Of Laughs. And Wilco it's, have a song called the, where they say you've changed and huh. shot in the arm. It's just I keep hearing and I've heard all of these songs and, and I'm yeah. like, it just sticks out to me because of your 10 year old record label. I think it's uh, I don't know. It's in the vernacular. There's also a mural. There's a there's a <laughs> that has very, nothing to do with you guys. Nothing to do with us. The mural Though we Queen get Street. asked about it with some regularity. Queen and Dover Court, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I don't. I I'm, congratulations on you've changed <laughs> is all I meant to say there. And uh, is there a song from Dark Blue that we can go out on? Oh yeah. <laughs> You've been waiting for this. <laughs> no, I forgot about time. this part. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, whatever you want to play is fine by you me. You know, the intros and the outros. That's the that's you kind of stick that. <laughs> I part. usually do the outros in post. I do ask it, the person after they've drum, left to pick a song. Do a drum fill at the beginning. <laughs> I'll leave that to one of the Romanos because there's quite a few of those <laughs> on this record. There is a shocking number of the songs and or begin with with drums. Cool drum patterns. I will say, yeah. like, I'm not. I I I like them. I'm mm-hmm. a, as you know, I'm a drummer, but I, there's some really cool drum parts on it. And, and like I say, just, I hear 
cool stuff on this. I hope people listen to Dark Blue. It's a great record. But is there one song I'm that you would remember if there was anywhere I was like, no, we can't start with a drum solo. I feel like there was one, but there was I, I'm not remembering which song it is. Well, the very first <laughs> song, Fireworks, mm-hmm. has like a false start. Yeah, I just left that in. No, I no, I, cool. I, I assumed it was, but it's a false drum beginning. Yeah. And then it actually cuts out and then the song begins with everyone. Actually, yeah, that's a weird one. It, 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 it discredits my theory of there being so many. That's a weird uh, something's going on with the drums, I think, on the record. That's all. I think by the time like I liked that kind of false start, which isn't really so much a false start as just like, you know, like you hit the drums to indicate you're ready to go kind of thing. Like it wasn't like a failed attempt. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, sure. I meant as a song beginning, it's a false I mean, start. when you make a record, like almost every song has something like that at the beginning. Right. That one sounded interestingly musical to me. And then at some point I realized that was going to be the first song on the record. And I was like, that could be a cool yeah. start or whatever. Yeah. Should we just play that we song? We could just play that one. <laughs> 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 it seems like that would make the most did sense Did you not point. release... What did you release around the time of... Uh, I feel like you wrote a song that alluded to the tragic, the hip or Gord Downey or something. Mm. What song was that? I'm tr- Did you not do that? There was a demo version of fireworks, which is on SoundCloud. If anyone really cares to, it was this song to Google search. It was this song. It's a different version of a different recording of the song. Yeah. Recording, but is the intent the same? It's the same words. Exact same words. Yeah. So it, same uh, harmonic structure. And they have a song called the, the D the, chord. <laughs> the trash they have, <laughs> have a, one of their bigger songs or popular songs is called Fireworks. And I know there's not a connection to that per se, but is there, what was it, what was going on when you wrote this song in, in terms of how you were feeling about them or Gord or what was going on? Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know if it relates. It maybe relates. Well, I thought that's how you contextualize it, that it was sort yeah. of inspired by, you saw at least one of the shows. I went with you. You went with me. I know that for a fact. <laughs> we went to one of those tragically hip shows, and um, uh, yeah, I just wondered if there was something you could articulate about it, or have I drawn too fine a connection between? I think you've drawn too extensive a connection. Yeah, though there might be some sort of connection there. Well, sorry, I. I <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we just play it? And let people decide. Um, what should I say about that? I don't know. I don't know. Watch me firework, watch me turtle. When you draw a circle, you can begin anywhere. It goes back to the circles that you were talking about. Yeah, definitely. And definitely. this notion of watching me firework and watching me turtle, watching me kind of... Um, Expand and contract. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that... Sorry. I I, mean, okay, I I would say the connection... I'll actually, I'll actually try and engage with this. Please do. The, <laughs> thanks for my, a better interview show, job. doesn't it? I hate when people say, I don't know, to my questions. Anyway, go ahead. I think in the Tragically Hip song, Fireworks, he's using the term for like that, I don't know, almost romantic or something like that, that explosive sort of moment of, I don't know, indication. I don't want to say like revelation, like it in their song, it kind of marks a moment. He's using that image to sort of, (laughs) <laughs> it's temporary it's, yeah it's exactly temporary so in yeah. a moment that's i guess what i'm trying to get at yeah temporary towers soar or something yeah so i think i'm maybe using it in the same way and then contrasting it with the other uh ideas of repetition so i think I'm, i might have taken that metaphor and then run in my own direction with it i just wondered if there was something about that tour and that what he did with what he had left that inspired it's, yeah you. it's pretty it's unique i've never i've unique I've, I've never i think about it sometimes and i'm like i've never i got to go to five or something like five of those shows and i've never seen in retrospect like that's the, that's yeah it was just mm. such a amazing compulsion for an artist to have to say i'm going to do this make myself do this for the people that yeah, he need me to do it. And uh, in mean, in his last interviews, Leonard Cohen also spoke about like the 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 gift of having the time to put your house in order. Yeah, and I think um, 
that last tour by the tragically hip can kind of be seen in that way yeah. you know putting the artistic life in order and making the final statements that he wanted to make yeah well it's an awesome song and it begins this record dark blue so i thank you for picking it even though i maybe i picked it somehow i apologize if i did <laughs> But this is Fireworks by Stephen Lamke from Dark Blue. Steve, thanks so much for uh, this time again, as always, for being on the show. It means yeah. a lot. Thanks for always talking to me, Vish. <laughs> Very special thanks again to Stephen Lamke for being on this, the 471st episode of Creative Control. I believe I have to check the guest book and see what uh, other people have done, but I believe Steve may have just set a record for most appearances on this show. This might be his fifth appearance on this show. That's that's remarkable. Steve and I are old friends. It was nice to have him. Again, this is the 471st episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms. And on things like Spotify and YouTube and Audio Boom as well. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for, like uh, one of the ones that Steve was on, there's a, a variety of them to choose from, at least five now. If you can't find one of those on any of those aforementioned platforms, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook, 
Follow us on Twitter at Vish Creative or follow me directly at Vish Khanna. You can also listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time, around the world at CFRU.ca or on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. Also visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. Thanks again to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton for their in-kind support for this show. Thanks, too, to Jim Guthrie for letting me use the instrumental version of The Rest is Yet to Come to end the show each week. And uh, as always, thank you. Thank you for listening to the show and subscribing to the podcast and telling your friends to do the same. That's how it keeps going. That's how the word spreads. So thank you for doing that. And, uh, yeah, more episodes to come, probably with Steve Lanky, among other people. And uh, I hope you'll keep keep tabs on the show. I will talk to you very soon. Goodbye for now. Oh, I, before I go, I just realized that there, there might be a discrepancy in what I've been saying. I think Steve Albini has the record for most appearances. But Steve Lampke is close. close. But just guys named Steve. I have a lot of guys named Steve on the show on a recurring basis. I'm partial to Steve. So if your name is Steve, give me a shout. <laughs>